Jim Ratcliffe is bidding for a minority stake at Manchester United in return for sporting control of the club. Now this presents a really exciting opportunity for the club because it gives them the chance of reassessing some of the processes that they have on the sporting side and ironing out some of the problems that they've seen across the last few years. So in this video what I'm going to do is engage in a really fun thought experiment where I put myself in Jim Ratcliffe's shoes and ask myself what would I do if I was given total sporting control of Manchester United. So here is my five point plan for how to fix Manchester United. But firstly, a caveat, I am in fact just a bloke on YouTube who makes videos. Jim Ratcliffe, if you are watching, this is not financial advice, do not do anything that I am about to say. Now in preparation for this video, I have spoken to a lot of people who work in the football industry, but I don't want to give the impression that I know the ins and outs of what is going on at the business level at Manchester United, so I'll be giving lots of caveats along the way. So with all that out of the way, let's jump in with point one, and point one is appoint a sporting director who can protect the long-term sporting interests of the club. Now the sporting director is going to be the most important person that you hire because the sporting director is going to embody the vision that you have for Manchester United on the football field. That means they're going to be in charge of the philosophy of the club, they're going to be in charge of the game model that you're going to try and employ players and managers to fit, and they're going to be, at the end of the day, the person who looks forward into the future to make sure all of these ideas are played out. Now the long-term aspect is important here because if we zoom out for a little moment and take a bigger picture view of the sporting structure at the club, what we can see is there's lots of different departments all orbiting around the sporting director, most of whom are going to have a focus on the short term. Now for some of these departments it's quite easy to see why the short term might be a priority. So we've got the two teams at the top here, the women's team and the men's team. It's quite clear why they might be focusing on the short term because they need results now. They'll be less worried about results in a year's time because as the old adage goes, you're only five games away from losing your job when you work in coaching staff. So there's always going to be a short term priority for people in the coaching department. Similarly for the medical department and the player welfare department, their job is to get players ready for the next match day. So again, you can see that short term priority. Now there are of course other departments where it may seem as though they have a bit more of a long term focus. For example, the Youth Academy is developing players over a long time and recruitment is thinking with lots of transfer windows ahead. But again, it's very easy to get caught up in the short term, start recruiting players for certain managers, start developing players for certain managers. And so the reason why the sporting director is so important is because the sporting director is always going to push back against these departments and say, this is what the long term vision is. How are we enacting that vision on the pitch? And that's precisely how it should be. There should always be this push and pull between the sporting director and the departments. And that's why I've represented this relationship with a two-way arrow. But this is a really important point because the most successful clubs are the clubs who are able to balance off short-term success with longer-term vision. And this brings us really nicely to the second point on my five-point plan, which is number two. Use this moment as a chance to reflect on the processes on all of these departments around the sporting director. Now obviously each one of these departments is a separate hierarchy in itself that's going to be extending outwards away from the sporting director, but this presents a really nice opportunity for the new sporting director to come in and assess the processes of each of those individual departments to make sure that they're doing exactly what it is that they want them to do. Now that isn't to say that the sporting director should come in and rip up the blueprint for these departments, instead they should use this as an opportunity to see what those departments are doing well, think about maybe ironing out some of the problems that exist there, and even making new hires so that each of these departments can operate as efficiently as they might need to. So this is all about delegation because as we've said, the sporting director needs to be able to focus on the long-term vision. And the only way that's going to happen is if each of these departments is functioning independently, only requiring oversight from the sporting director when absolutely necessary. Now this brings us really nicely onto my third point in my five-point plan, and that is Think about how you want to implement data from the off. Now the use of data has become fundamental for running football clubs in the present day, but there is no universal way to use data in your football club. And so this presents a really nice opportunity for Manchester United to decide how they want data to function within their club. On the one hand, they could implement a data system which extends across all of the departments within the sporting side of the club. A good example of that could be that the data department could build a database for the medical department to input all of their injury data about the players into so that everyone across the club has access to that information. Now, on the other hand, a lot of clubs won't have this pervasive data system that runs across the whole of their departmental network. Actually, many data departments will only be responsible for data provision within very specific departments. So for example, the 
recruitment department can obviously benefit from the use of data, so the data department may only focus its data provision on recruitment. Why might this be important for Manchester United? Well, again, this presents a really good opportunity for them to assess how they want their data department to function, make those decisions now so that they can then implement them over the coming years. And there's another area where Manchester United need to make a decision now about the future. And that brings me to the fourth point on my five point plan. And that is overall the transfer protocol that is in operation at the club. Now, transfers have been a bone of contention at Manchester United for a while now. And in fact, in the Eric Ten Hag era of the eight players that Manchester United have paid fees for, three of those players are players who have played for Eric Ten Hag before. And actually, you can add another player in Sofyan Amrabat as a loan player during that time as well. And actually, if you break down the fees themselves, 46% of the fees that have been spent on players when Eric Ten Hag is at the club has been spent on players that he has previously been involved with. Now, this suggests that Eric Ten Hag carries a lot of weight in Manchester United transfer business. Why might this be a problem? Well, we started this video saying that we needed to appoint a sporting director to protect the long-term sporting interests of the club. And if the manager who, as we've already said, has a short-term priority, has too much of an influence on that squad, that squad is going to start losing its longer-term vision. So as we said, we need to have that balance between longer-term vision and shorter-term success. And one of the ways that you can do that is by having a transfer committee where you can balance some of these shorter and longer-term interests off against each other. Here's an example of how that might look. So once again, we've got the sporting director at the top who is going to make sure that those longer term interests are protected. And then below the sporting director, we now have a group of people who are going to be able to represent those shorter term interests from across the needs of the club. So we've got the head of recruitment here and the head of recruitment will probably oversee both the traditional scouting department and the data scouting department as well. And they'll probably have their own representatives in the meeting as well. So we've got the chief scout here on the traditional scouting side and then the head of analytics who will be representing the data scouting side as well. And then of course we've got the first team coach as well who will be in those meetings to have their say, be able to profile the sort of players that they're looking for. And usually what will happen in these instances is that every member of the transfer committee is given the power to veto. So if any player is being considered that any one of these people doesn't want to bring in at the club, they can use their veto and that player will immediately be removed from consideration. And the benefit of this sort of approach is it helps you to avoid the problem of thinking the squad building is focused around one person, usually the manager, and makes the squad building activity a much more club focused thing. So if the manager does move on in the next few seasons, it doesn't make a difference on the squad because the squad is being built for the club, not for the manager. And this brings me to the fifth and final point of my five point plan for how to fix Manchester United. And that is point five, don't forget the human element. Because it's all very easy for me to sit here and draw up a really nice structure for how a club should run. But whenever I've talked to people who work in clubs, they always say to me, well, you can talk about the club however you want. You can talk about the hierarchy however you want. But often the functioning of that hierarchy is a very organic thing. And that is because every moving part here is a different human personality. And as we know, different personalities can get on well, can get on badly. And so the functioning of this structure is only as good as the people in this structure and the relationships between them. And so an important part of the sporting director's job is to be able to foster these kind of relationships, build a culture out of which a successful football club can emerge. So that's my five point plan for how to fix Manchester United. If you would like to apply for any of those positions, do get in touch with me and you'll hear from me shortly. If you like this video, please consider subscribing to the channel. The Athletic is home to some of the world's best sports journalists, including David Ornstein, Daniel Taylor, Ollie Kay, Amy Lawrence and Rafa Honigstein. With the latest transfer news and insight on every Premier League football story that matters, theathletic.com puts you inside football. And you can try it for free now for 30 days. See the link in the description.